this time to you um, and uh, desire your will uh, to be done. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're moving on into the um, uh, chapter two of Leviticus. And uh, um, just uh, like to read the first uh, uh, first verse here in Leviticus. Now, when anyone presents a grain offering as an offering to the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour, and he shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it. Usually, uh, when we're talking about uh, Levitical offerings, uh, we're generally usually talking about a blood offering. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, that's what would come to our mind, first of all. But this is the one exception uh, to that. This is the meal offering. And it's the one different one, and it's unique. It's a bloodless offering, and it's a grain, it's a grain offering. So um, this um, thing that I ran into, I'm sure you did too, if you did some study, uh, what did you find out about this name that's been given to it? Did anybody do find anything unusual about it? The grain offering? Mm. The grain offering um, in the uh, King James, it's called the meat offering. Because in 1611, uh, meat was a word synonymous with food. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to go to to uh, supper together, you might call it, you know, uh, you're going to share meat. Because uh, meat was used just as another word for food. And the King James uh, uh, called it meat. The uh, Hebrew folks uh, didn't call it meat. They called it meal, M-E-A-L. And uh, um, oatmeal. Pardon me? Yeah, oh, oatmeal. like oatmeal. Uh, and uh, that um, had a ring to it, a, a meaning supporting it that had to do with a gift. You would bring this kind of an offering to God. It's, it's a gift. Did you ever uh, just having a wonderful time with the Lord and it comes to your mind, man, I'd like to do something special for him. I'd like to, I wish I could give something to him, maybe out of my lifestyle or whatever, but uh, because of the way he's blessed your life, provided for you, healed you at times, and uh, uh, constantly involved in your life to bless you, Sometimes we can get overwhelmed with a desire to say thanks in some unusual, meaningful way. At least I think that happens to most of us who've walked with the Lord any length of time. This is the offering that's set aside for that very purpose. Mm -hmm. Now, that's used in another way, too, but basically that's it. And that's why the Jews called it a... Uh, a meal offering. It was, it was a time of uh, giving. It was, the meal was a gift to be shared uh, with the Lord. Um, I can't. No, I don't think anybody cared, but it looks like it's pronounced um, a um, minka. Does it mean anything to me? Is it you? No. Forget it then. <laughs> Just remember that that word minka means uh, mm -hmm. a gift. Uh, and so the Hebrews uh, called it a meal offering. Uh, the New American Standard and some others uh, don't call it meat or meal. They call it a grain offering. And um, that's kind of interesting because it, it, throughout the scripture, you'll at times see the word used for grain is the, with the word corn. You ever notice how many times corn is in the Bible? Yeah. You know what their corn is? Their corn is not our yeah. sweet corn like or a cob like we're thinking of a corn. 
or those kind of kernels on the corn. The only kind of kernel that they knew throughout the Bible, when they when they mentioned corn, they're talking about wheat. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, they're talking about that little kernel. It's sure not a cob, but it's a when you see corn in the in the Bible, mm -hmm. it's talking about wheat. And so uh, um, the New American and some others uh, call it a grain uh, because it's wheat. And uh, the uh, corn in their terms would be wheat. And well, I, it would also include barley too, wheat and barley, cousin, kissing cousins in the grain family. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, interesting to notice that the New King James uh calls it uh, like the uh, hebrews do they call it a meal offering mm -hmm. now here's the to me what was the interesting thing if you go you know you're here in uh, leviticus 2 chapter 1 it talks about see the grain offering in the first phrase there mm -hmm. first part of the sentence now when anyone presents a grain offering you look, you go to your concordance, and what would you look up? Grain, probably. Grain, Grain, yeah. Right. Or if you're, uh, they use a different word in your translation, like corn or something like that. You look it up, mm -hmm. what, you know what you're going to find? Meal. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Um, Nothing. <laughs> and it's not there. What if you put in meat offering? Not there. It's not there either? Not there. They've got one word. Uh, for a grain offering, and uh, they tell you what, uh, uh, not one word, they've got uh, this situation that there's no word for this grain offering uh, in any spot where it mentions there's a word for grain, but anytime they have grain offering, you won't find it there because it's not there. The uh, writers, and I believe under God's control, put the word in there that they believe it's talking about. And you read all down below here, and you see they're all they're talking about is wheat and grain offerings. So mine puts grain, even though another might say meat. That's man's term for it is implied by what name they gave to it. It's not a biblical name, uh, whether you're using meat, meal, or grain. That word is not, anytime it's talking about the grain offering, there's nothing in your Bible because there's nothing there in the original writing. I thought that was interesting. So don't get too upset if one version has a different word in that spot than, than another version. Both versions are Im implications. That, uh, that are given by uh, the uh, people who were translating the originals. They they added a word in there. And I'm surprised that it's not italicized. Mm -hmm. You know? I'm surprised they still put meat in, like, Frank's version. Yeah, meat. Meat? You have a King James? Yeah, meat kind of thing, yeah. You I know, the, the new King James don't use meat. Right. The new King James uses meal. Yeah. I'm surprised that they wouldn't put, they wouldn't have changed it in there, meaning that updated the language. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mine says grain, and I got in the New King James. You got a King, New King James that says grain? Might as well. No. Okay, I didn't know that. I didn't yeah. check that. Any, you know, the different New King Jameses. There must be more than one. <laughs> <laughs> so, but does it make any difference? No. And that's, the, that's the only point I wanted to make. God knows Hebrew. The, yeah, I'll get out say. The, oh, the offering is definitely there. What it's named is, uh, like I said, it's by implication. So it's not specific. So don't make it specific. And don't go to war. War over it. Yeah. So what have I got out here? What an offering. Here's what we're going to look at when it comes to the meal or the grain or whatever you want to call offering. I guess that's what we're going to look at. Uh, it's three different ways 
that a person can make that's kind of an offering. Three way, we're going to look at various ingredients. Some are added, some are not used at all. Um, either way. And then we're going to look at uh, the um, activities of a person making a meal offering. And then what the priests have to do with it all. And uh, that's that's our path of travel for studying uh, the meal offering. Oh, I had this up here. I forgot to put it on the board. Good book. Okay, Leviticus 2, uh, first couple of verses. We've already read one. Uh, and uh, talking about um, um, what's in the grain offering, it'll be a fine flour in verse 1. And uh, then he shall put pour oil on it and put frankincense on it. Verse 2, and he shall then bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests. Not the Levites, the, the Aaron, the Aaronic priesthood, mm -hmm. the ones that are doing the spiritual uh, work within the holy place and the mm -hmm. holy of holies that was here and so on. Those are only the sons of Aaron, who was a Levite, right. but it's a certain line of the Levites, Aaron's line. So uh, this offering is going to end up as a provision of God for the Aaronic priesthood. Uh, it's part of his provision for them for food. Verse 2, I'll, I'll only, uh, let me read a little further. They'll bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, and uh, shall take from it his handful. <laughs> I underscored that in my Bible. There's a per particular part of this uh, offering that has one particular use, and it's only a handful of it. Uh, out of all that is brought. He says, uh, the priest shall take his handful uh, of its fine flour and of its oil with all of its frankincense. He, so you see, you've got a flour set full of fine flour, and there's only about a cup of it or a handful of it that's got frankincense or oil on it. So on. Hmm. That's the part that the priest will scoop out with his hand. That's he has to do that. That's for him um, to use as a burnt offering. He says here he'll take this fine flow with its oil and frankincense. He'll offer it up in smoke as a what does your Bible say? Memorial. A memorial portion. What do you think this memorial? Who's memor Who's who's being remembered? God. Yeah, I think so. I think this memorial, whatever person brought this offering, mm -hmm. whether God has been blessing them, you know, and, and uh, uh, taking um, the usual blessings upon him. Mm -hmm. This is. He is going to, the priest is going to take this. This represents all of these wonderful blessings. God has been given to that individual, and he wants to say thanks for it mm -hmm. in a very real way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the priest takes that handful of what he's, uh, what the person is making this offering in remembrance. He mentions those things. So evidently, they must tell the priest. Uh, in this process when he's bringing it, why he's bringing it. I'm honoring the Lord. I'm mm -hmm. blessing the Lord back. I, I, he, I, this is not something he demands. This is something I want to give him because I love him. Mm -hmm. And all the care he's been giving me, I want to say, I want to give a, a hug to the Lord this way. Well, it also, it also shows that he knows that it's from the Lord at whatever yes. that, he's, that he's honoring. Absolutely, you know, and stuff yeah. that he he's he's not thinking it was just pure luck mm -hmm. that right. was given by the by God. And a lot of us do the same. You need to do the same thing as pray to him, say thank you, Lord, for that. Sometimes God kind of encourages us to give some extra. Mm -hmm. um, it's a way of being grateful mm -hmm. for His graciousness, and um, so that's a there's a that's the memorial portion. 
on the altar. So that's going to be utterly consumed as a sweet smelling savor to God. Mm -hmm. God loves this. God loves when we don't pinch the pennies in the sense of saying thanks. When we lavish him with some appreciation, he, he doesn't overlook that. That's special to him. That's a special, it's more special to him than it is to you. You actually took action and moved on something uh, by way of uh, loving and uh, the God who loves us and provides for us. Mm -hmm. Memorial portion. An offering by fire of a soothing aroma to the Lord. Lest you think this is a costless adventure, this offering. Uh, stop and think what it took to get that offering. Um, because the person who's bringing the, I'm calling it a sack of, uh, I don't know these ancient term about amounts, we could tell it doesn't really make that much difference to us to know if it was a quart or two quarts or a gallon. Or, but we anyway, to get that, uh, they had to provide, they had to, be, they had to do some farming, they had to do some gardening. They had to plant some seed. And uh, that seed uh, had to be taken care of and nursed, watered. And uh, and then uh, uh, as it grew and was protected, it came to the point where it could be harvested. And that's work. Uh, rather tedious work from the sounds of it. They didn't have threshing machines and things back like that back then. They had to cut it with probably a scythe or a sickle or, you know, and then, uh, and then had to winnow it, you know, and uh, prepare it. So he, uh, and it says, what kind of flour does he have to make out of this? They had to grind and fine. Fine flour. I don't know. If well, wouldn't it be when he's talking about fine flour? You know, if you just ground it, you just have the husk in it. It looks like you buy an whole wheat bread, but they want the fine flour without the husk. Yeah. And uh, yeah. the, I read a cultural book on some of the things they do over there, mm -hmm. fine flour. You know how they define fine flour? Fine flour doesn't only have to be ground. It has to be sifted. Right. It has to be, um, uh, it requires crushing first, mm -hmm. then grinding, mm -hmm. and then sifting 13 times. Yeah. That's most of you know that sugar they make for uh, decorating uh -huh. cakes and stuff? Real powder. Oh, oh confectionery sugar? sugar. Yeah, but that, yeah. That's flour, but it doesn't like yeah. that. Yeah. That, so when you see fine flour in there, you know, stop and think, that's quite a requirement. Yeah, no food value to it all. Well, I don't know about food value. <laughs> I know it's got, I know it's got uh, value in God's eyes. <laughs> it may not do my body that much good. Yeah. But um, that's on the 13th, so don't sneeze. <laughs> yeah, don't sneeze. You'll start all the <laughs> Get more on your face than in your. But anyway, that's the fine flower uh, issue. And, and it pictures, uh, of course, the foreshadows concerning the, the person and work of Christ, his consistence of um, character. His character was sifted many times. We have read that in the New Testament when, when the Redeemer came as the Lamb of God and he gave his life. He even called himself the bread of mm -hmm. bread of life. Mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't say it in the New Testament, but he must have been made out of fine flour. Because he certainly, uh, his service and his character was... Um, Flawless, of course, perfect. And uh, he had gone through the sieve many times, uh, and we'll mention a few, but we get the picture right away. You know, uh, as he uh, uh, was uh, confronted by unbelievers, by the religious people of the day, uh, by Satan himself, uh, he was put to the test over and over and over again. And uh, 
He had gone through this uh, without any sin. So not only, another thing we can think about too in this is not only was Christ a, uh, a redeemer of perfection, well sifted like fine flour. Mm -hmm. When his life enters ours, when we're born again, we're expected to offer a life similar, controlled by him, a life that gets put to the test, not once, not twice, over and over and over again throughout our whole life. The sifting changes. There's this, this 15 thing or 13 thing might be cultural for uh, Israel uh, and the way they created fine flour. But it also is speaking that uh, God puts us through the sieve. A lot of times the trials that, that come into our life really are the result of, of discipline for evil or bad. I think many times uh, God allows us to be sifted like he was sifted to demonstrate uh, the kind of character and a life a person under his control operates under. We want, we should uh, have a, a love response to him that when uh, we um, express it, it will be expressed uh, thoroughly uh, as a result of how he's been putting us through life up to this point, and we're we're praising him for it. Even though there are many, many, there are tests in there and trials, nobody likes them. I don't like them. You don't like them. We don't like testing. We don't like being put through the sieve. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't even like being put through the sieve. Remember the night before his crucifixion, there's any way to miss this. You know, let's go that way. We don't have to, we don't, ex doesn't expect us to enjoy trials and trouble, but we learn the things and we become the kind of a person uh, that he can control and that he wants when we do go through those things. They're a blessing as much as we don't like them. Believers, we're sifted for pure, pure motive to develop uh, a deeper love than uh, we currently have and uh, to, um, to touch and to feel and to enjoy uh, recognition that God's at work in us. Uh, it's his power that's delivering the, the kindness of our, of our life with him even before he calls us home. Anyone want to add to that? Uh, there's a lot of things we can imply with that, but that's the basics, I think, mm -hmm. uh, for um, this, um, uh, what we read here in, in verse two. And you notice this is presented um, uncooked. This is not baked. This is not cooked. This is the raw uh, cereal, if you will, uh, without uh, being doctored, and it's labor intensive. It's it's intensive for for life itself. So there's three ways to present this kind of an offering uh, to God. The first way is to present it in an, as uncooked flour. Second way uh, that it can be presented to the Lord is as um, unleavened cakes mm -hmm. and we can read about that uh, let's read verses three and four <laughs> and the remainder of the grain offering belongs to Aaron and his sons it's a thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord by fire now when you bring an offering of grain offering baked in the oven see here now it's, now it's baked in the oven it shall be unleavened cakes of fine flour mixed with oil uh, or unleavened wafers spread with oil or anointed. The word spread just means to, um, uh, to be um, rubbed with oil. 
So those two verses tell us now it can be a grain offering baked in an oven. The, uh, that's, that's one way. Uh, verse five is another, uh, adds more information to this. Uh, it be, and because it says, if your offering is a grain offering made on the griddle, it shall be a fine flour unleavened mixed with oil. There you're going to see mentioned two ways to, uh, I call it bake it, mm -hmm. cook it. One's on a griddle, and what's the other one? Um, in a pan. It's a pan. Uh, what's the difference? If it's a griddle, it's like a flat surface. Yeah, the, the oil can drain out of it when it, it cooks, just like a barbecue. Yep, that's a flat surface. Right. A pan has edges to it. Yeah, it retains the oil. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you can cook it and, and let it mm -hmm. uh, form into a, a pancake without filling up uh, the edges. And you can also uh, bake it all so it stays all together in a way. But that's the only difference that I know of between a griddle and a pan. Um, so he says, uh, at unleavened cakes, you can present it there and, and four, and five, talk about the griddle, and seven is the baking pan, where he says, now if your offering is a grain offering made in a pan, and I got a little thing over to the side, a lidded cooking pan uh, is what that is talking about. It shall be made of fine flour with oil. So it's the same ingredients, it's just baked uh, either raw or baked in a, on a griddle or baked in a pan. And uh, these uh, kind of uh, give us an insight too to the um, the Lamb of God when He is coming. And it's looking forward. It's foreshadowing uh, that um, this offering uh, made. He is that kind of an offering. The first kind where it's it's just uh, uh, baked into cakes is where it's uh, in an oven. When when you take the offering portion and you put it in the oven, you can't see it. It's surrounded in an oven, I'm assuming. It's out of sight. A lot of what Christ went through in his sifting, if you will, and in his uh, uh, giving his life as an offering, uh, was like that, it's unseen suffering. Uh, and the Father uh, put the Lord through those kind of things, unseen by man, but yet um, one of the first ones that comes to my mind is when when uh, he let um, uh, the Lord go through the suffering of just, call it, of just growing up and uh, learning obedience and uh, uh, coming up through the uh, tests and trials of growing up in the early years. Uh, and going into the desert and and Satan uh, testing him um, um, in ways that uh, we don't mankind wasn't uh, company to. God puts us through things a lot of times that He does in secret. Nobody else knows what He's doing in you. He does some things out of sight. Uh, and here, this offering kind of pictures that, uh, that he's uh, been uh, put through the test uh, out of sight, like being baked in an oven where the heat and trials aren't visible to mankind. Secondly, uh, they need, they need A-N-E-A-D, the uh, grain into a, into a cakes. And then verse five is where they, Bake them in a in a in a um, a griddle on a flat surface, which is kind of like the sufferings that the Lord went through at the same at the hands of Satan. Uh, now it's out in the open, and uh, Satan would uh, uh, put the Lord to the test, if you will, put him through the sieve, uh, and he would uh, respond to that uh, in 
ways that were visible to man. Remember when he took him up on the pinnacle of the temple? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was visible. Uh, and that was uh, just one of many. He uh, Satan put that whole herd of pigs on the side of the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of the hill. Yeah. And um, um, that was recognizable to man out right out in sight. I mean, we could name a bunch of other ones, but some things God the Father put the Son through, uh, and some things the enemy put the Son through. And uh, also the third way there in verse 7 about uh, the frying pan, uh, it's not flat like the griddle was and open, but it's broad and it's shallow, but it keeps things together. And that's kind of like the sufferings that the Lord endured uh, at the hands of man. And so um, these kind of things, we know that this is what go, this is, these are the unleavened cakes uh, that typify, um, typify the offering who was the person of Christ as the um, redeemer mm -hmm. and as the, um, Provider, I like when we have communion, we uh, mention the body and the blood. He is the body. This points to that. He is, he is, he's our bread of life. He's the body that um, um, shows his, uh, the human side of his um, being, and it shows what he suffered for us, what he's done. Uh, in all ways, whether God was uh, putting him to the test, the Father, or whether the enemy was putting him to the test, another sieve, or whether mankind was putting him through another series of types of uh, uh, of, a, of sieving, and that's uh, a picture of how God works in our life too, by in a progression. He doesn't hit us at new birth with with the testings that he gets us with later after we've gotten to know him and trust him and depend on him, then the, the sitting becomes finer and finer, requires more reality and breaks us down, if you will, into a, a powder, breaks us down into a, into a offering uh, that would, could be called unleavened cakes. When you talk about unloving, that means don't add an ingredient that causes it to rise. Yeah. yeah. And we're going to get later down here. We're going to get later down here with ingredients. We're going to talk about the leaven, the frankincense, and the oil. Mm -hmm. It comes with a map of crackers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. So uh, one way. Tom, does it say an amount? It does. I mean, I know about the whole offering? Yeah. Uh, yes, um, um, let me come back to okay. it, but it does. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that it's probably a minimum, but you can go much, bring as much as you want, probably. Yeah. <laughs> I guess well, I was looking mean... to see if I can find it real quick. I know there's different sections to it, like your memorial portion and so uh -huh. on. Yeah. And, uh, okay, and be that easy. chapter it's six. It's, it says uh, 14 yeah. is that if you offer grain offering of first fruit, so it's mm -hmm. got to be from you know the best ones. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, but it's got to fit in a frying pan, so we can't. That's right. but that's, that's just <laughs> the part that you're offering, though, that, but, yeah, but that's you're right. bringing, but you're bringing more. They've already taken a handful of right. to uh, burn with fire, right? Uh, and then the rest, uh, I know it does sons. say here, uh, I'll find it. Uh, if not this morning, I'll, yeah, that's fine. That's yeah. It is a certain amount, mm -hmm. I think. Okay, good question. I'm making a note to myself, so I'll check that. Well, while you're checking, yeah. So when we we get into the section about the uh, the green offering that's been cooked, yeah, it doesn't talk about the frankincense. Was the frankincense to be included? Yeah, I think it's yeah. green. Frankincense, yes. But the frankincense was primarily for the handful. 
Mm -hmm. Well, only because you don't want to eat that stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it, it smells good when you burn it. Yeah, yeah, it smells good when you burn it. It's a resin. Yeah. yeah it's very tell the Lord knows if you're doing it or not because of the it rises and he can smell it. Yes, because yeah. it says he's uh you know he, he savors the sweet of it. Sweet smelling savor. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's, it seems like it's intended through throughout the reading that it's just the part that is going to be burned on the altar that uh, has all the ingredients in it, mm -hmm. which is what would mean fragrance and, mm -hmm. and the oil. Well, we're moving right on. We're moving right on from from this uh, from the unleavened cakes to the baked ones. Uh, next in verse fourteen, and. Uh, it says if you bring a grain offering of early ripened things to the Lord, first fruits, in other words, uh -huh. mm -hmm. you shall bring fresh beds of grain roasted in the fire, grits of new growth, for the grain offering of your early ripened things. And um it, let me read verse 15. You shall then put oil on it and lay incense on it, the grain offering. And in 16 said, that's what the priest will offer up. Right. Uh, in verse 16, the priest will offer up in smoke. It's the memorial portion that has the uh, frankincense and the oil on it. And the rest of the offering goes to the sons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. And we're going to read over... Yeah, uh, yours, uh, yours said grits. What's it? You, yours says grits, right? Yeah. Which means the fine part, because mine says crushed. Crushed is what grits grain. means. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I just had grits. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yeah, grit. Yeah, Southern boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I still like them. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's G, how do you say G E R E S? Garris? Garris, yeah. That's the, the Hebrew word for it. Mm -hmm. And it literally means um, crushed. Mm -hmm. And uh, the King James Version, I, I'm not sure if the new King James, but the King James called the corn beaten. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the first fruits that belong to God. Uh, and that's uh, what's the Jew was very familiar with first fruits because first fruits belong to God, whether it's a person in your family, first male, mm -hmm. is considered first fruits. The early uh, reaping of any crop belongs to the Lord. That's first fruits. Uh, any animal that's born, the first one, mm -hmm. it's first fruit. So a Jew knew that anything that God has provided, given to him, should be recognized as not your own. That's God's. You're just giving God back what belongs to him. If you're not giving God the first fruit, you're robbing God. Mm -hmm. He says uh, here uh, that it's, uh, even produce, other kinds of produce also, any kind of a crop that's harvested, uh, the early part is first fruits, the first portion of it. But it's roasted and then, and notice it's roasted and then added oil and frankincense. Um, something in here, Jim, made me think of they got some involved in theirs too. You know, the other besides the the burn portion. Mm -hmm. And I forgot where, uh, where it was exactly, but... Um, We'll get, we'll run into it again. Well, down in 10, it was saying that, you know, after the offerings, what's left is Aaron and his sons. Yeah. So it had to be like a sack, uh -huh. at least. Yeah. Or they're, you know, because that's probably one of the ways the Lord was providing for the priests. Yep. Yeah. From yep. the harvest. Well, they must have had some nice feasts. Yeah, I'm trying to find out later. It's going to be so large. It's going to be rather confined. 
Uh, it's not just anybody. It's true. <laughs> Jim says there's no bacon, though. No bacon? <laughs> no bacon for the priests. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they didn't ask for a hog. No, <laughs> no. no. <laughs> sacrifice. <laughs> that was through the back door. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we'll come to it. Yeah. All right. Now, where was I? Oh, uh, talking about um, the early ripe and the first fruits. Uh, Jesus pictures himself, you know, as a uh, uh, as a grain of wheat. And involves some first fruits. Uh, John chapter 12. We'll take a look there just for a moment to see the, the consistency there. There we go. John chapter 12, verse 24 in particular. Uh, where Jesus was preaching and Jesus answered them the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified so it was approaching the time mm -hmm. here at this portion in John where he's coming to the day of he'll be going to the cross and he says to them truly truly I say to you unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies. Mm. It remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So, and I believe uh, that uh, the portion I was reading there does is being applied to the person of Christ. Yeah. And we know that uh, when he uh, died on the cross, he mm. created a Mm -hmm. Harvest. Mm -hmm. It's still going on. What did yours read? Uh, that's where it refers to the corn of wheat. Yeah, a corn of wheat. Corn, yeah, wheat. corn of wheat. Yeah, yeah. Right. the King James yeah. version that yeah, refers to wheat as corn. Yeah, that's why I said yeah. uh, if you look corn up now in your concord, you, you'll find grain. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the whole the Bible, there's not a mention of corn like we know of corn anywhere in it. Mm -hmm. Anytime it mentions corn, it's talking about wheat. Right. The Indians know that. The Indians. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, the death of Christ, uh, uh, if you will, started a harvest that, uh, that we're involved in. And we're going to look at another passage here, too. Because he pictured himself as a grain of wheat, and uh, the result of that grain of wheat going into the ground and then rising, uh, and now it's not going to be alone. It's not going to be by itself. If it dies, it will bear fruit. Fruit, much fruit, much fruit. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, he suffered. He bled, died, he was beaten, he was buried, he arose, and uh, he multiplied. He is the early um, harvest. Uh, we'll, and we'll see it mentioned, in, go over a little further to 1 Corinthians, of course, chapter 15, you'll see reference. To that I think John not first John John first Corinthians 15. I'm sorry I used to know the books of the Bible <laughs> this part of getting old is that it <laughs> Which I didn't know. <laughs> and some of the things it also mentions salt as far as get into it. Oh, okay. You're just ahead of me. That's okay. Fifteen. I'm glad you brought it up. You're seeing it coming, huh? Fifteen what? Oh, I'm sorry. Fifteen uh, twenty and through twenty-three. Okay. Um, but now Christ has been raised from the dead. 
okay, we got a crop mm -hmm. coming up here. Um, and he says, he's raised from the dead the first fruits of those who are asleep. Mm -hmm. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. So those that uh, when Christ uh, resurrected, uh, he brought with him uh, those in Abraham's bosom. Yeah, those in Abraham's bosom. Some of them even walked the streets of Jerusalem. Uh, they were like the early part of a big harvest. Someday we're all going. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't been resurrected yet ourselves, but uh, we will be. And but he gave us an indication of a coming blessing, just like the old first fruits were belong to God and were the promise, if you will, the guarantee of a coming full harvest in the world's way of thinking, seeing things. Same thing is true spiritually. The first one to be resurrected, the leader, number one uh, of resurrected human is Christ. And, and a handful, if you will, that he brought with him out of Hades, uh, the, out of uh, Abraham's war zone. And I think that's what's being talked about here. Well, and now, I mean, Paul was saying, you know, to die is gain because when we pass now, we go to be with the Lord, right? It's, yes. We don't go to Abraham. No. We, yeah. Uh, Abraham's present with the Lord. present with the Lord. Right, but you're not resurrected yet. Right. Well, are they resurrected or are they, I, I are they as we are, will be? Yeah. Like so, you are, like you would be if you died today. Right. Mm -hmm. And you entered his presence. But notice, uh, he says, each in his order. God's got a plan and a purpose and an order to things. Mm -hmm. God is very systematic. That's one thing we ought to keep always in our minds. God isn't haphazard. He just doesn't fly around doing different things that are unrelated. In an order to us. Yes. Verse 23 uh, here in uh, 1 Corinthians. But each, each, see, in Christ, all shall in Christ all shall be made alive. That's verse twenty-two. But each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, two thousand years ago, and after that, those who are Christ at His coming. That's the the resurrection of the rest. That's the the final full um, harvest of. Uh, Then comes the end when he's delivered up the kingdom um, to the to the God and Father, which he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. So uh, there we see a picture here. I carried a little, maybe a little bit too far uh, for time, but uh, we see that they could a person could present a um, a meal offering. Of uncooked flour, a meal offering of uh, unleavened cakes, uh, whether whether uh, baked on a griddle or baked in a pan, and um, and it's the first fruits, grain dried over grits is the third way. Uh, yeah, I I thought, thought that word grits too. And it's an all of so, but that is what it means. And he is our resurrected leader, uh, the first one. There's uh, where we're going to pick up for next week is looking at uh, the uh, various ingredients uh, that go into this offering. And um, uh, basically, we're going to be talking about uh, leaven, we're going to be talking about honey, and we're going to be talking about olive oil, and we're going to be talking about salt. Mm -hmm. So we'll hit them all next week. So then we got to a good, great point. Now that verse in 1 Corinthians, thinking back about what we discussed on Wednesday night, about the Gnostics 
Yeah. The one that we were that John was going against was uh -huh. saying that was going to his churches and saying that he they denied the humanity of Christ, that he wasn't a man. Yeah. Which he had to be because Adam was a man, mm -hmm. and that's where sin came in. And so Christ had to be humanity. He had to be a created man in order to be a sacrifice for to us, qualify to for, qualify for to pain for our sins. Yeah, and he referred to himself. While the Gnostics were saying, were, were were that's what John first in First John was fighting against, was yeah. telling people against. Right, but they, he referred to himself yeah. as son of man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean. He was truly man. He was truly human. Yes. And he's truly God. Yep. That's the hypostatic. And, and we can ask him how that all happened when we get there. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Amongst other things. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. My question. Okay. Yeah. Quick one. Um, at the rapture, it says the dead should rise first and those who yeah. lie with them. Think that the Old Testament saints? That's when you're getting a new body. No, that's the church. Just that's the resurrection of the church. So, the rapture. The, would that be going into the millennium then? That they probably have yeah. us? So, yeah. Pray. Let's pray. Thanks again, Lord, for your presence and what uh, we've seen this morning. Help it to become clearer and clearer as we think on it through the week, and uh, use it in our lives in a in a special way. And um, may it encourage each one of us to um, deliver an offering, a meal offering. A thanksgiving and honoring uh, offering to you for thy graciousness, for all the blessings you heap upon us day by day. And uh, may, uh, may we take a lesson from this to uh, think of thee more in, in, in a more endearing way and one that does demonstrate our appreciation for you as our Lord our Redeemer, and our Shepherd, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.